everyone, um, my name is Sam and welcome to our special event, The History Behind the Fiction with Alison Stewart. But first I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we are all gathered and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I am excited to welcome everyone to our History Week chat with award-winning author of cross-genre historical novels, novels Alison Stewart. We particularly focus on her new Australian historical romance, The Gold Miner's Sister. Alison is also a historian and along with her historical romance books, she also pens historical mystery books under the name A.M. Stewart. Welcome, Alison. Hi, Sam. Thank you very much for having me today. Oh, thank you for speaking with us. Um, could you give us a quick summary of The Gold Miner's Sister for our audience? Well, have, you can have a look at her first. <laughs> She's beautiful. <laughs> Um, the the Goldmine Sisters is actually the second in a series of books uh, set in the fictional town of Maidens Creek, which is a, a small gold mining settlement in West Gippsland, which is actually not far from you guys. Um, <laughs> and, and those of you who are familiar with it may think it looks a little bit like Walhalla, <laughs> which yep. is not, not entirely coincidental. Um, so uh, the first the first book was the postmistress, which some of you may have read, uh, and of course that centred around um, uh, the, the postmistress of the town, Adelaide, and uh, and uh, an itinerant American Confederate uh, officer who lands up in in the town. Um, the second book moves along with this, but it's a totally new set of principal characters. Um, but many of the familiar characters from the postmistress uh, are there. So if people got attached to people, uh, to characters, then uh, they, they will appear at various points during the book. Um, so this book is actually around the sister of uh, one of the um, principal characters in the first book, uh, who is Will Penrose, who was um, Caleb's friend. And Eliza Penrose has now arrived in Maidens Creek, hoping to meet up with her brother and start her new life together. And yeah. the other protagonist in the book is the new mining engineer at the Maidens Creek Mine, because of course Will, at the end of the last book, went off to, uh, to start, uh, start up the Shenandoah Mine um, yeah. at Pretty Sally. And, uh, and that's really where the story begins. Lovely, thank you. Um, so, with um, how much does your knowledge of the history of the time shape the story that you write? Um, that's an excellent question, and it's really uh, history is really very important to me. I, I have a I have a degree in history, um, and I'm also a lawyer, so <laughs> the facts tend to matter very much to me. And uh, I think as a historical uh, fiction author, you have a huge responsibility to readers to get it right. Because a lot of people, and myself included, learn history from reading fiction. Um, and often, often the, of course, the dry history books are very inaccessible to, uh, to well, I find them dry and boring, so I'm not sure what everybody <laughs> else says. So if you can pick up, pick up your history through, uh, through reading really good historical fiction, uh, that, that's a fantastic gift that I, as an author, can give to readers. Um, and that's why it is really so important to get it right. Uh, interestingly, my, my own background is actually uh, in, a, in the English Civil War, which is <laughs> about as far removed from 19th century Victoria as you could possibly get. Um, and I actually found uh, the, the research for the Victorian book so much more difficult. <laughs> Possibly really? because it's so well, it's not so, uh, I, I mean, the English Civil War has been part of my DNA since I was a very small child. Whereas, um, and, I, I, I kind of draw things instinctively from it. Whereas there's so much, of course, written, there's so much more primary material about yeah. the 19th century. Yeah. And, and so much more recent knowledge about it too. So, you know, you have to get, you have to, was it kerosene lamps or what, you know, what sort of lighting were they using? What sort of irons were they using? And uh, yeah. it's all those sort of little domestic daily details that probably a reader just scans over and they just get, they should, be just dropped into the text as just little like like pepper and salt you know like spices you don't overdo it you just, yeah. you just leave it there and it, it, it helps build the picture of what what the characters were at the time the characters were living in and I think um, you did do that well I, I I did notice that sorry oh you thank you no I oh, thank you very much <laughs> <laughs> but yeah it is I, I I really have to sort of put myself into the town and uh, be, because I, I actually do know Walhalla fairly well. Uh, smell the smells, walk the walk. Um, 
just just feel that atmosphere of those oppressive hills coming into that that narrow narrow little valley um and it's all of those sort of uh, what we also say, say show don't tell but uh, as yeah. i said i think i think all those little details are so important and uh, and without sort of overpowering the narrative with well here's everything i know about hard rock gold mining. <laughs> and can i tell you i know more about hard rock gold mining than any author should know <laughs> Yeah, it's very true what you say, though, because there are there are novels I've read that have given me insight into historical events I never would have grasped otherwise, because it's almost like they're three-dimensional insights rather than facts and figures and descriptions. Yeah, 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 because you're, you're, you're walking in the steps of the people, well, a good author is taking you in the steps of the people who were experiencing that i mean we, we look back yeah. at events now of course with hindsight but of course at the time you're it's, it's like what we're going through at the moment with covid you know we'll probably look back in two years time and go well remember when uh, but yeah. now we're living it and and it's i imagine it's like what it was like living through world war ii you just didn't you were you were huddled around the radio at night now we're huddled around dan andrews every, every day <laughs> and uh, you, you know and zoom and oh my god what's the case number today and you know that, that sort of thing without we don't know what the end point is um, yeah whereas you know in, in two years time we'll look back and say well thank god that was all over by december or, or whenever um yeah so it's that kind of bringing that into into the reader's minds and here's a character who's living through these events but they don't know the end we know the end but they don't know the end yeah and that's the other thing about it too and, and I, I guess the, a reader can identify in a different way when a character's in the midst of it rather than, yeah. Well, that's, just... that's, that is, that's a hope, you know, that you, 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 you feel that, you know, particularly writing about the English Civil War, you're writing about battles and uh, you're writing about roundheads and cavaliers. And I mean, we, we know that the, uh, the king was restored in 1660, but for my characters in 1651, they have no idea they're about to fight this huge battle, which, they're about, which we know as readers they're about to lose and it's all yeah. going to go horribly pear-shaped, but they don't know that. <laughs> they're very optimistic. <laughs> Awesome. That, that actually segues, it segues well to the next question, which is, do you, do you feel you have to prioritise the story or the historical accuracy? Or do you find a balance between the two? I think it's important to find a balance between the two. Um, with my, with my uh, Australian books, um, I wasn't, because I wasn't sort of basing it around particular dates so much. Uh, and also using a, using a fictional town too, which is one of the reasons why it is Maidens Creek and not Walhalla. Because as soon as I, I'm, if I'd made it a real town, then I'm absolutely locked into real historical yeah. events. Whereas I, as a fictional town, I could actually pinch all the best historical events from, uh, from the town's history and sort of muck them around a bit and, and move them around. And as long as, people realize that and which is why it's, an author's note is really important um the one date i did move consciously was and it's such a small thing was in the postmistress um, one of the characters is given a copy of cole's funny book funny picture book which actually didn't come out till about six years after the uh, story set and sure enough my editor picked it up <laughs> she said you do realize this book didn't come out yes read the author's note you obviously haven't got that far yet because that was a deliberate thing i knew i knew it, it was uh, but nothing turned on it you know it wasn't going to be important it wasn't like the moving the battle of naseby um and at least you so, know your editor's doing the right job well she yes yes i could say kill her so many times but, uh, she's very, she's very very good like that yeah so you don't you don't play with major events um yeah. and as i said sort of sticking to a fictional a fictional town gave, gives me a lot more flexibility because there are a lot of uh, particularly in the post mistress more than the gold mistress there were a couple of uh, lovely amazing stories coming out of um out of contemporary reports because you go to trove uh, which is of course our state the, the library yeah you know what fantastic all archive fantastic archives <laughs> you go to trove and you, and you can you just go down a rabbit hole of research you know yeah you type in walhalla and suddenly all these amazing stories come up so i was able to sort of take some real stories that happened such as there was a smallpox epidemic which is surprisingly prescient of me given today's today's situation yeah. and there was another sort of mysterious death and there were things like that that i could i could then sort of uh, weave into my own narrative which fitted my characters really well um 
but without being tied to the fact that actually that smallpox ep ep uh, smallpox scare was like about four years before my book is set that you know that sort of thing oh uh, yeah yeah so yeah so you can massage it a little bit but um yes if it's a major major historical events yeah, they're immo immovable you can't uh, you can't you know say say if world war one had been declared in maiden's creek world war one was declared on a date you know and that, yeah. that date is immovable haven't quite got that far into maiden's creek yet maybe if i keep going <laughs> with the series we might get to world war one <laughs> are you thinking of continuing with the series well there is a third book definitely a third book ah uh, um, um, we get to hear it we'll, first here. Fantastic. You do get to hear it first, first there. Uh, yes, I've just just signed that dotted line. Uh, so yes, hasn't even really even got a working title yet. All I know is it's moving the action forward quite a bit, like about twenty years, and yep. involves a couple of the characters that you have met in the Goldmine Sister and the Postmistress. So uh, yeah, I think I think readers will really like it. <laughs> oh, terrific! Something to because definitely look forward to. Between us, ch children grow up. <laughs> yes, yes, that's right. Lovely, and a whole new time frame for you to have to research as yes, well. Yes, yeah, yeah abs well, absolutely. And and now I've thrown myself into the whole back into the whole medical profession again. So, oh well, no, <laughs> <laughs> nursing in the eighteen nineties. What was that like? I don't know. That's true. Um, I in another interview you mentioned actually the, the little historical snippets that you. Um, run into in your research that inspire you with certain things in a book. Did any snippets inspire any parts of the Goldminer's Sister? Um, the Goldminer's Sister, yes, uh, in, in that I, I wanted a fairly major event um, to occur and um, so I, I, um, I did have a very very good long hard look at the Kresik mine disaster which um, uh, of course, Creswick is nowhere near where Skips land. Um, but it was one of Australia's worst, worst mine disasters and happened just before Christmas, early 1870s. And um, a mine collapsed and started filling with water. And uh, I think 22 miners died in that. And if you go to Sovereign Hill, um, they actually they actually have a, a a Kresik mine disaster experience that you can go <laughs> you can go and go down the mine and it all goes black and there's a sudden roar of water coming towards it. I'm I'm very into terrifying. I'm a, yeah, I, and I'm um I'm a visual person too. So so spending a whole day at Sovereign Hill by myself, getting to do all the things that I, I've always really wanted to do and just be a big kid, really. Uh, yeah. That was great fun. And uh, then to find that they were actually actually recreating the Kresik mine disaster was, was a bonus, more, more, than, uh, more than I could, I could believe. So, yes. Yeah, so, so the experience so the, um, of that. Yeah, so you incorporated yeah, that reading, experience. Reading, reading yeah, and reading about people's accounts, so a couple of a couple of the miners did survive, but not very many. And of course, a number of widows and orphan children they left, and it was a it was a terrible tragedy. Um, and as I said, one of Australia, one we would we don't know it, but it was one of Australia's worst mine disasters. Uh, wow. Yeah, yeah, so that's probably the major one. The the ones in the post mistress, I think I've already mentioned, were the uh, was the smallpox scare that came to uh, came to yeah. Lens Creek, and uh, also the mysterious death of the doctor on uh, on the Melbourne coach, which were both were both true stories. Slightly, yeah. slightly massage, but basically uh, and basic facts true. Yeah, <laughs> but yes, no, may I mean, there's no major big things that happen. In, in 1873 in Mason's Creek, <laughs> apart from the Crescent Mine disaster. Yeah, so that's that's the sort of thing I like to bring in if I possibly can. And if yeah. you can get the first-hand accounts of it, that really helps to colour the way it's written. Mm. Yeah, and round out the authenticity of, of mm, what you're very much so, yes. creating. Um, your storyline in The Gold Miner's Sister, it explores the way fate and circumstance were often thrust upon women in the past is recognizing this important to you i uh, I, dedica I dedicated the first book um, the postmistress to our pioneer women uh, because i they they are the unsung heroes heroes of of australian history and uh, i i think a friend of mine put it very well when she said um, you know, we didn't have make big wars. We didn't have sort of uh, ma major disasters. What what we so what we have, we have to kind of invent our own heroes because because they're 
The women are like the drover's wife, like Henry Lawson's the drover's wife. They're the unsung heroes. They're the, the women who just went ahead and got on with things. And um, one of the more interesting characters uh, I really like in, in my books is the, uh, the, the brothel owner, Lil. Uh, because I, I based her on a real character called Kitty Kane, who, who uh, people from around Walhalla will know very well, who ran a, a sly grog shop somewhere on the road between Walhalla and Aberfeldy. And she, oh, wow. just, she, just, she just epitomised everything about women at that time. She'd been a dance hall uh, dancer, uh, but by the time she died, she was so heavy um, that they were carrying her coffin, because she was greatly loved, she was carrying her coffin down into Walhalla. And uh, they got about half a mile. <laughs> she was so heavy, they, they dumped her on the side of the road. <laughs> and uh, Kitty, Kitty Kane's grave is still there on the side of the road between oh, really? and Aberfeldy. Aberfeldy. But, uh, you know, here was a woman who sort of, she, she, she danced across, you know, she danced across America and um, in her youth. And uh, like Lola Montez, you know, she'd had this amazing life and she'd ended up as uh, running a sly grog shop on a, in a gold field. Uh, but greatly loved by everybody who knew her. So, you know, and little pe people like the midwives and, and those sort of people. So when I started the series, I, I really wanted to sort of look at some of the women and the roles that they played. So yeah. I'm slightly pushing the boundaries a little bit with the postmistress because although women were postmistresses of small country towns, it was a little bit later in time than Adelaide. But certainly okay. the school mistresses, um, as in, in the gold miner's sister, were absolutely true to form. Again, another very productive um, time spent at um, Sovereign Hill. <laughs> Yeah, for all the goldfield schools up there. Um, yeah, so the so the women's stories are really important to me. My own uh, my own great 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 something grandmother was a, a, came out here as a convict in the seventeen nineties, and how okay. she sort of survived her life and 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 built rebuilt her reputation. And uh, I just uh, we could we could not do it. We could not do what they went through. Really. Yeah. yeah, 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 absolutely. And there was so many um, strong females in your book yes but they're the you know they're, they they play that they're the um they're there but it's always the men who are sort of like to think that they're in charge you know like the yeah. town council of maiden's creek um, who who are totally manipulated by their wives <laughs> particularly <laughs> the bank managers who, who have no choice their, their wives are a pair a pair of uh, <laughs> you wouldn't want to encounter those ladies yeah, and, and the schoolmistress and the um, yeah, all the, all of those women, and he, and even people like Nettie Burrows who appears in both books. Um, Nettie Burrows, she uh, quietly sort of stood by Adelaide when Adelaide needed a friend, and she she then went on to have her own life with with uh, with Bill and uh, set up her own shop, and um, and they just quietly kept kept the town running and um, kept everybody sane and kept the home fires burning. Um, but yeah. it was a hard life, and uh, you know, if the uh, if the miners, as, as happened in, it, you know, if your if your husband was injured in the mine, there was no workers' compensation. Um, and no. if you had wife and children, you know, it, it was poverty. It was the, it was the poorhouse for them. It was very sad. Yeah, I I um, it, this sort of was it hard to leave out sort of um, any fascinating historical details because they weren't relevant to the story? Like, was there a it, lot? It is, yeah. yeah. And that's what I was saying before. You, you have to know where to use your, sprinkle your spice. Yeah. And uh, you can come across the most wonderful stories. Oh, I'd love to write that. I, I, actually, I have a classic example. Um, there was a, a, a terrible tragedy, a tragic drowning that occurred on the Thompson River where about five members of the Italian... Um, community who were the woodchoppers up on the Thompson uh, were drowned um, biggest funeral in Walhalla no absolutely so sad so I, 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 I originally wrote that into uh, the gold miner's sister and uh, after some battle with my editor she sort of said look it really it's not relevant to the story <laughs> She said, I that, like it so much. So, so, she said, apart from that, too many people are dying in this story. You can't <laughs> have any more deaths. <laughs> yeah, so, so we have to have those little battles uh, as an author and, uh, and an editor sometimes. And you, you grind your teeth and you, you curse her to the high heavens. But at the end of the day, she was absolutely right. It, it added nothing to the story. It just made me feel better. <laughs> Did you pull it away? Did you tuck it away for later? 
Oh, well, you know, as you said, if there's any more Maidens, well, there is, will be at least one more Maidens Creek story. So, yes, it may, it may yet make, a, make an appearance, but, uh, yeah, unfortunately, it didn't make it into this one. <laughs> <laughs> but, yes, it, it's about that sparing use of the spices. So, I think it's like the, t uh, or like the tip of an iceberg, you know, what you see in the book is, is sort of maybe that much of the research and then there's this whole sort of <laughs> yeah. iceberg underneath that uh, just, uh, you just have to sort of ignore. And, hope you and in writing, it. you have to know so much more than you're actually saying anyway, don't you? Like you well, need you to know everything, Absolutely but you, you only and say I, a bit. And as I said, the danger I see, uh, particularly a lot of more inexperienced historical authors is, here's everything I know about hard rock gold mining, and I'm going to spend three pages telling you all about it. Yeah. You don't, you as a reader don't want to know that. You just want, you just want the little, the little snippets that set the scene of what's happening it's not it's all about what's important is what's happening with the characters not what's happening what are they doing yeah so as long as you can visualize what they're doing you don't need to know absolutely sort of uh, hammer and nail exactly what it is that uh, uh, what it is about hard rock gold mining so there was <laughs> a lot of technical stuff in the book um that was kind of unavoidable but i kind of hope i didn't bore the readers too much with that <laughs> yeah yeah no, you didn't. Um, and I actually, one of the things I was interested in was the inclusion of folklore. And I, I loved your inclusion oh, of the knockers. Yes. So the, the, knockers, the, yes. the mischievous little creatures um, that hide in the mines. As an example of sort of folklore miners are brought over from the old country. Very um, much so, yeah. How, how important do you think the folklore is to sort of understanding the people of the past? Absolutely, because they were, they were, um, I, I don't even know how I went down this rabbit hole of sort of researching miners' superstitions and how superstitious they were, you know, about not having, you know, you never let a red, well, you didn't let women down the mine, let alone, and red-headed women were just, oh my God, that's going to that be a disaster. That was fascinating. Uh, it really was. And the, and the knockers were, were ubiquitous. They were, it wasn't just the Cornish miners, it was the Welsh miners and uh, the German miners and everybody had this little little tradition about the knockers. So those of you who haven't read the book yet, it's um, before a mine collapses, uh, there, you very often hear a knock, 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 uh, which is the rock starting to move. And um, the, uh, the miners believed that, that, that there were these little fairy, fairy folk who lived in the mine who would warn you. And that was their warning, that was them banging out their warning. Others believed it was them actually causing the <laughs> banging and, away and, and making the making the collapse. So depending on which version you read, um, and so and the Cornish miners definitely believed it. You know that, that, that they were the Tommy knockers would uh, would call, you know were there to look after them, and they had to feed them their bits of the uh, bits of pasty at the end of their meals, or yeah. they wouldn't look after them. So and the, I like the idea of the Tommy knockers uh, stowing away in the luggage coming to Australia. <laughs> That was one of my oh, most favourite was... inclusions because it brought, it, it really humanised, you know, that every, yeah. every you know, time has its rituals and its superstitions and, um, yeah, it, it made them very real to have that included, I think. Oh, thank you for that. Yes, no, I, I, I loved, I loved putting that sort of little stuff in, little, that sort of spirituality and the, the little yeah. bit of, um, a little bit of, as you say, the mythology as well, because we don't, Intrinsically, as Australians, we don't actually have that ourselves. So what we do have does come from the old country. And, yeah. uh, you know, I'm right, in the 1870s, I'm writing about people who were first generation, you know, they were the first, they'd come over. So they were the first immigrants. So they were bringing all that stuff, just as later immigrants, um, like, like our European friends in the 50s and um, the Asian, our Asian friends in the more recent past, you know, they all bring their little bits of um, their own mythologies with them. And, and it's nice to acknowledge that and, uh, yeah. and to sort of feel that still keeping on. But intrinsically in ourselves do we have that you know no no we don't really you know Bunyan's well any any colony goes yeah from, any uh, Europe, anyone of um european descent yeah. i think doesn't yeah. i mean we didn't we had no idea of the mythology of the land that we came to no and we've and, been very disrespectful of it but yeah, yeah, so, yeah. but and so we've got to stop, stop and listen to the uh uh, to our, our indigenous brothers and sisters uh, about about what their their uh, their their folklore is and what they yeah. uh, what they believe and how yeah how it was all shaped by that yeah um, absolutely now with you uh, you learned your passion for history from your father yes that's um, right how yeah. did he 
how did his passion influence yours? Could you tell us a bit about that? Oh, my, my father was, he was a wonderful, uh, wonderful man. He was um, what I'd call the last of the British gentlemen. He'd, he'd been a British army officer and uh, um, he'd been brought up in a part of um, Worcestershire that uh, was quite historical. In fact, at one point in his life, he'd actually lived in the dower house of Blenheim Palace. So he, he'd had this quite, a, quite amazing childhood brought up in these large houses um, with this huge history as well. Yeah. And, um, you know, I can't remember a time, particularly when he sort of sat me down and said, I'm going to talk to you about history now. But uh, <laughs> I, th I, I think it was the books he chose to read to me. Dad, Dad used to, every Sunday evening, uh, afternoon, he used to read, read to us. And it was never sort of the books that anybody, it was the books he wanted to read, not what right. was suitable for an eight-year-old, <laughs> um, which really started me off on the, my love of the English Civil War because he, at the, I was eight. He read me Daphne du Maurier's The King's General. And I mean, there was, it was everything. There was hidden skeletons and there was cavaliers and roundheads and ghosts and all. I, I just loved it. I read it, re, I re, I mean, because it's, it lives on my keeper shelf. And I thought, I'll just reread it again. I thought, my goodness, this is a very unsuitable book for a eight-year-old. <laughs> but it, he, because it was his passion, he, he just, he just, it just sort of flowed from him, I think. And yeah. so, you know, we, we went through a time in the, particularly in the um, late seventies where they were re making a lot of historical films, you know, Nicholas and Alexandra, Cromwell made it, was made into a film. And uh, dad, dad would take me to all of those movies and then he'd tell me all the things that were historically wrong with it. <laughs> but yeah, it was something, something we shared. He had, a, he had a deep and abiding passion for the American Civil War. Um, which I think, which is probably why Caleb, the, the hero of the first book, came to pass. He's a, he's a little nod to Dad, and is oh, rather that's than nice. Civil War. Yeah, that's lovely. Yeah, so, yeah. That, but that wasn't your. That's not been the. You like the English Civil War, don't you? Yes, no, I, I, well, also I'd never written a book that didn't involve a war of some kind, so <laughs> uh, that was my little nod to having a civil war back in the book again, was to have a, have a veteran from the American Civil War come to Australia, well, right, we, yep. they, oh, which effectively they were. I mean, that was the thing, it was so many uh, people just w found their way to Australia, uh, they, whether they were um, former slaves or uh, uh, Caleb's, Caleb's a, con uh, a confederate, you know, lost everything in the war. Um, from all over the world too, not just from America, obviously. And uh, yeah, it, it, that's how we became this amazing melting pot that we were. One of the one of the uh, one of the people who uh, were indicted for the Eureka Stockade. I think he was an African American who had been a freed slave and come out here to uh, find his fortune and found himself in stocks instead. But uh, yeah, so there was, we've got this incredible melting pot even back then. But, yeah, but we were. Yeah, I don't think we realise that. I think we think it's more recent than it actually is. Yeah, yeah, no, we tend to think we're very we're Anglo-Saxon. We weren't. No, As I said, there was, this, there was this enormous Italian population who were cutting wood up, up in Walhallet. I mean, the, the mines were hungry for, they needed as much wood as they could have. And so this settlement um, established itself on the uh, banks of the Thompson River. And, uh, and that was what they did. They provided the wood for the, the burners and, and they were Italian. The one, the yeah. one thing that wasn't, the one nationality that wasn't there was Greek. Uh, only, I say that only because I have a very dear Greek friend who said, oh, I wish you'd write me into your book. And I said, well, they were, actually, I don't think there were any Greeks in, really? there, in Australia in the 1870s. So, Do you know when the Greek... No, I don't, I don't, I don't know. Greek people started coming over? Greece itself didn't really... It had... Um, it was not actually a country for a, a long, long time. And my knowledge of Greek history is a little shaky, but I, I, uh, I think at that stage, it was sort of still, they were still overthrowing the Ottomans and um, it actually kind of didn't exist. So there might've been people from Macedonia or, or, uh, yeah. or the islands or somewhere like that, but from Greece per se, not so much. Yeah. Right. That's it. Well, and you've mentioned that um, a third book's coming out in this series, but can you tell us about any other future, you know, the future historical projects you've got going at the moment? Um, well, um, call me mad, but let's face it, I'm really not doing very much else at the moment, except <laughs> sitting at home. Um, yes, I've, I've just signed a contract for the, the third Maiden's Creek book, but I've yep. also, um, I've also, uh, also contracted to write a, a third one in my, um, Singapore Sapphire series or my Harriet Gordon mystery series. So uh, that's exciting too. Um, yep. 
Yeah, so I think that both of those will keep me busy probably for the next 12 months or so. <laughs> um, more, than, more than enough. I have to sort of switch between Australia and Singapore. It's, uh... <laughs> yeah, interesting. And so uh, uh, do you think both of them are due out next year, hopefully? If they uh, unfortunately not. I think, well, obviously co the COVID thing has, um, well, particularly with my New York publisher, sort of, well, New York just basically shut down for three or four months at the start of all of this and um, yeah. I think things just sort of went up in the air so between uh, yeah uh, unfortunately neither book will be out next year but um, the evil in emerald or whatever it's going to be called this uh, Harriet Gordon will be out early 2022 and the third no. maiden's creek book will be mid 2022 uh, it'll go in a flash you know <laughs> only have to write <laughs> it <them> will first. <laughs> absolutely absolutely <laughs> Uh, the publishing the publishing business is uh, is long and slow, and so basically it takes me probably uh, less uh, probably takes me about a year to write a book, and then it takes my publisher a year to publish it. So uh, it, it's it's a, not an overnight thing. <laughs> Are you writing full time now? Yes, yes. I I retired from my my work as a lawyer and company secretary. Um, Ooh, back uh, about three years ago now, and uh, and the, and the world just dumped on me. I suddenly found myself with two 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 book contracts and uh, and all the time in the world. So, uh, yeah, be careful what you wish for; it might come to pass. <laughs> An absolute writer's dream. Fantastic. Yeah, well, it it was as I said. It's it you know it took me twenty five years to become an overnight success. <laughs> Yeah, very... so yes, keep, you know what they say when you go to these inspirational talks and they say, now visualize your goal. And so I'd keep visualizing my, I, I, my goal was to be in an airport bookshop. I, was like, I actually don't think I've actually made that one yet. And uh, yes, and it suddenly happened that I, not one, but two contracts came my way. Was, uh, you'll have to, um, you'll lovely. have to take a little bundle into a, the next time you go on a flight into some sort of airport stick, and just stick, stick, them, <laughs> stick them on the shelf somewhere. <laughs> oh, well, Do never mind. It will happen one day. Anybody yeah, who yeah. sees any of my books in airport uh, bookshops, send, send me an email and uh, there will be something in it for you. <laughs> Definitely. Take a photo. Take a photo Ooh, and send we it. We call them shelfies. Send me a shelfie. <laughs> And do you have any, in case we've got any um, writers in the audience, do you have any advice for them or historical writers, I should say? Well, particularly historical writers. Well, I think patience, obviously, as I have just said, patience is a virtue. Yeah. <laughs> don't, don't expect instant overnight success. It's, 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 a lot, it's a hard craft and it takes a lot of learning. Um, so just, just keep reading the books you love and... Um, going to as many seminars as you can join writers uh, i'm a i'm a member of the romance writers of australia and they are my tribe they are fabulous um uh, fabulous source of um knowledge and i've support. heard they're very supportive of their authors. brilliant yeah. yeah yes i wouldn't be here without them so um yes organizations like that are fantastic and you don't actually have to be a romance writer you know the 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 basics of the craft apply across across the board I think actually romance writers make particularly good crime writers because we're writing, because um, romance is so much character driven rather than plot driven. So we tend to bring that to our, our crime writing as well. So our, uh, rather than just sort of, here's a crime, let's solve it. We talk about the people as well. Uh, I've noticed that as a bit of a trend across crime writers, uh, romance writers who've turned to the bad. We <laughs> <laughs> or the good, depending on. You know. Well, it was Janet Ivanovich who used to write it. She wrote quite a lot of romance in her early days and she started writing her Stephanie Plum books and she was asked why she'd turned to murder and she said, oh, well, I, uh, I went through menopause. Oh, I <laughs> uh, love it. And, and my husband retired. <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect. I love that. I haven't heard yeah, it. Yeah, I'm probably misquoting her, but it was something along those lines. And I, I, like that. I totally Lately, I'm sure it. anyone in the same situation completely understands. Yeah, um, Absolutely. So also, so that people can send you their shelfies, but um, can you, where is the best place for our, for any of our audience to find you online? Uh, well, already... I'm everywhere. I'm, I, I'm, I'm Eddie everywhere. I'm on Facebook and Goodreads and Pinterest and Instagram and Twitter and all the rest of it. But I think probably the best place to start is probably my website because you've got all the links there, which is just alisonstuart.com, A-L-I-S-O. 
Oh yes, beautiful. As, as written, as written, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm never sure which way I'm pointing. <laughs> beautiful, Pat. You can point both ways. Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> yep. So AlisonStewart.com is the best way of, of contacting me. Well, fantastic. And um, I just say that Alison's books are available from the library in hard copy on our shelves. Um, ebook, we have them in BorrowBox and RB Digital, and e audiobook, um, we have them in BorrowBox. Oh, brilliant. Yeah, there's an audio. I love the audio for this. I, I'm a huge fan of audiobooks, and they've done an audio for the Goldmine Sisters. We're, I'm not sure about the Postmistress. Um, there wasn't one done when she first came out, but we're, we're talking. We'll see what happens. But uh, oh my God, I do. I used to do all my reading in the car on the commute to work. I love them too. <laughs> I love audiobooks as well. How do they do all the accents in the audiobook? Oh, I mean, they're poor narrators. <laughs> I know, there's so many. She, man she manages really well. She does a really good job. You know, when, when you, stop to, you, you stop thinking about it as being your book and you're just listening to it because, oh, wow, I'm really enjoying this. <laughs> uh, no, she don't, I'm, I'm really mean. And the, Singa the poor girls who do the Singapore books, you know, that's even worse. <laughs> I, I yes. love the narrators. Of, I think they're very talented. They really are. They're so, yeah. so talented. Yeah. It's been so lovely to talk to you today or tonight for History Week. It's been fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us, Alison. Thank you for having me, Sam, and I really appreciate it. And I hope everybody in Casey Cardinia is hanging in there and doing well. We'll, we'll get through this. <laughs> we will. Thank you. Same to you. Same to you. See you later. See you later. <laughs>